Hey everybody and welcome back. I am KRX and we are doing a beginner playthrough for Europa Universalis Solace 4, playing as Muscovy here. And we've just completed our first war against Novgorod and I gotta say, uh, we did pretty well. Um, I think we did a good job sort of explaining a lot of the tactical elements and, and sort of the physical movements of the troops and, and sort of like the, the actual physicality of winning the war. We actually forgot something really important at the end of the war when we were actually I, I didn't really go through like the uh, I don't think I spent enough time talking about the peace deal and like some of the values that you're looking for when you're composing your peace deal and stuff we will do that in the in the next uh war uh to a much uh, much more detailed approach of that that was uh, again it's so easy there's so many hundreds of different things that you're considering at any time it's so easy to take some of those things for granted and just get out of out of sync a little bit and take some of those things for granted we have not we've done the war deal we haven't played the game at all there's a number of different elements that are now going to be sort of like a problem right now for us um so there's kind of two different ways to look at that there's an internal stability issue with the new land that we've taken on that can affect our our stability in our main country but it can also obviously there'll be potentially instability in our new land because this hasn't been fully embraced into our country yet yes we control it we've taken it Novgorod's agreed to sign it over but there's no infrastructure in these places there's no um, Muscovy government infrastructure like like people leadership ruling over these new provinces actually making it so that these provinces actually uh, behave right these are still Muscov or uh, Novgorodian people living in these areas here that they never agreed to be part of the Muscovy um, nation. Only Novgorod as the state, right, handed this stuff over, but they've kind of abandoned their own people in a lot of these places, including Novgorod, right? We've taken over Novgorod proper. Essentially what I'm saying is here, there's going to be a significant amount of unrest, but the, but we need to actually do some some work on actually sort of integrating this land into our country and making it more usable and also allowing ourselves to restabilize so that we can go um, to war in the future. One of the things, uh, and also diplomatically, I don't know if I uh, mentioned that before I said internally, but diplomatically we have caused a lot of strife too. Um, these countries around us, they care that we just uh, ravaged Novgorod because that puts them seriously on edge in, in a major way. Um, if we look at the Livonian order here and we look at their opinion, it's negative. They like us still, but it is negative. And a big reason for this is something called aggressive expansion. We have by taking all this land, and this is something we could have seen coming in the peace deal. And I was a little bit too quick. And I just click, 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 boom, took a bunch of land and didn't even think twice. The funny thing is that kind of emulates the experience of a new player. New players just could be taking a bunch of land, not thinking twice. Nice thing is there's reasons why Muscovy can do that in this region and not very many people will care. But the people closest to us are going to observe this conquest and they're going to be they're going to be a little bit worried. We look at Lithuania, 33 with Lithuania, um, Poland, they have less because they're further away. But this aggressive expansion is how uh, 38 with uh, Sweden. This is how um, this is this is immediately hurting our diplomatic relations with the nations around us right they're seeing us as a warmonger they're seeing our aggressive expansion and it scares them and they can actually team up against us they can actually form a coalition against us if that number ever reaches 50. you can see it's slowly going to decay yearly but if we attack novgorod again we're going to be attacking novgorod before that's completely decayed because it slowly goes away that's yearly 1.8 yearly being uh, going away from that aggressive expansion so presumably if you do a lot of wars it can it can stack up and plus that's us attacking novgorod if we attacked livonian order this is a this is a catholic state these catholic nations would be even more on edge um, but because these because novgorod is orthodox a lot of the catholics actually don't care as much sweden would care a heck of a lot more if novgorod was catholic um, so this number would be much much higher um, and then distance between uh you know where a distance between the the borders of the countries that are affected also matters whereas poland doesn't really care because they're a little bit more buffered sweden cares quite a bit because they're right next to novgorod and, and they saw they really are being affected by this um and they know that we've now moved in to border them um if we look at some of the sunni nations down here you can see they really do not care i mean just a very small amount of aggressive expansion is being applied to these countries we could look at our fellow um 
countries in here, you can see it's a, it's a decent value. A lot of these smaller nations here are a little bit scared. Minus 56 for Tavir. So Tavir has hit the critical threshold. If you have 50 aggressive expansion with any country, they can they are eligible to join a coalition against you. However, you can't really have a coalition of one, right? The, the fundamental issue here is that you can't have a coalition of just one person. You need at least three countries to join a coalition. So Tavir can join, but but we've just noticed that these other countries can't. They they don't are they they just they're not there yet. So we have to keep an eye on this as we do future wars against the Great Horde, as we do future wars against Kazan, maybe future wars against Lithuania. We have to manage that number and make sure that these countries don't hit that that critical threshold. Novgorod, you can see, is at minus 70. We're, well, okay, I apologize, guys. I am in the coalition map mode, right? So we can actually monitor this from the coalition map mode. And you can see I'm not seeing dark red. If you see a lot of red here, you're in trouble. But right now, we're actually okay. 78 with Novgorod does mean they could join a coalition. However, they have a truce. Novgorod obviously can't join a coalition to fight us if there's a, a political truce between us. So so Novgorod and Trevir are the only two people that are really upset by what we did. We we got off lucky. We got off lucky. Again, if we had done that against Lithuania, there would there would have been uh, there would have been reprisals against us without without if we had taken that much land against Lithuania, people would have been upset. Um, but luckily, Novgorod um, is kind of an isolated diplomatic situation on their in their own sense, um, being a, a sort of a lonely um, Orthodox nation up here. Really, you know, Muscovy is one of the only other major Orthodox nations in the game. So since we're Muscovy, we don't have to worry about ourselves, except for we kind of do. We have to worry about the internal situation. If we, we notice there's a significant amount of unrest, if we hover over this provincial unrest, it's like... This thing is like blowing up like a like <laughs> like the the Fourth of July or something, right? Like I mean, there's a significant amount of unrest here for the Novgorodian separatists specifically, but we have other kinds of separatists too. We have these guys are looking to re, re, uh, rise up in a in a particular uh, province here, Kazimov, Kazimov. Yeah, they're down here. So that we knew about them, right? And that's mostly because this is a Sunni province with a different culture. So these people just just aren't happy but this has nothing to do with their conquest except for the fact that they have been agitated because of this aggre this uh, this sort of aggressive expansion we don't it's not called aggressive expansion when you're looking at it internally that's a diplomatic feature right the other thing we're looking at is something called overextension so as we overextend it actually reduces our ability to manage our own sort of internals right we can see here some of the negative effects of this we, we it's more expensive to raise stability so getting more stability is going to be harder. It increases national unrest by 3%. That's just a flat 3%. Well, the 60% the increases it by 3%, right? If we had 100% overextension or more, right, then these values would they would scale. In fact, if it's over 100%, that's 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 really bad news bears. That, that's when crazy, like, super crippling events can happen, and it basically tries to tear apart your country. So if you go over 100% on this overextension, it is not good. And you can see here, there's a convenient button that says manage it. How do we manage this? We're getting uh, reduced uh, diplomatic reputation, reduced improved relations. We're getting yearly corruption. We're getting uh, merc you know, extra mercenary costs. But that's not really so big of a deal. But uh, trade power abroad, minus 58%. So we're losing out on economic opportunity abroad. And then that national unrest, which is agitating these guys, right? If we didn't have this extra overextension, these guys would be a lot more docile. But they're being agitated. And we know that there's separatists over here just on the basis that we just took a bunch of Novgorodian land. So there's Novgorodian people that are that are going to want to resist this. It says that there's going to be 12,000 troops rising up against us, and it estimates this will happen in about four years. Statistically, it does all the math for you, but there's a bunch of individual provinces here, all the ones that we just conquered, right, that have a certain amount of unrest because there's there's a um if we click on these provinces or we go to the unrest map mode and again if you can't i have the map modes organized but if you're ever looking for one feel free to just um essentially right click you can add another map mode and then you can search through the entire list of map modes right so we could search through all of them here whoops trying to get there we go so there's all the map modes here and you could just find the one you want and add it to um the button clicks and sometimes I have two stacked on top of each other, like I have the culture one and the religious one and the unrest one. They're all together. So sometimes I have to click on one to phase through them. Um, also, they're organized by 
um, economic map modes, geographic map modes, diplomatic map modes, political map modes. So um, unrest, I guess, would be in the... Um, unrest might be in the uh, political map mode. There it is, the unrest map mode in the political map mode. So we can see orange. So we can see all of these areas are, are relatively uh, hostile. And we can hover over them and it'll tell us, okay, all the different modifiers for that. There's 10% unrest total. A lot of different modifiers, positive unrest. So we click here, there's 10. And if we're looking at this province, we haven't spent a lot of time actually looking at the province screens, right? We haven't actually spent that much time looking at tons of information on here. Right now we're noticing unrest unrest if we hover over this 10 percent, we can see all the modifiers there we're getting some from overextension we're getting some from war exhaustion right we just fought a war that that caused a certain amount of war exhaustion we could we could see how that's um what that's doing exactly in the stability screen and we can see how to get rid of that um, we have positive stability that's helping us there's a tolerance these are orthodox they do appreciate the fact that we're an orthodox state and these people are orthodox so there is some sense of unity and tolerance for these people because of that religious unity is we actually have a little bit of religious disunity we know that this province is sunni at least there might be i don't know if we took i assume all of this is orthodox up here though um so there's only a tiny little bit of religious uh, unity issue there and the, but then the big one the big one is separatism when you take over land you will get uh well in this case we got 15 separatism 15 unrest due to separatism and that will almost always create a um, equilibrium with the province that you just conquered at a positive unrest there will be a rebellion here there's really nothing it's not that there's nothing we can do about this there's a lot of things we can do about this but there will be unrest here and there will be a rebellion un unless we do something about it so there's actually a number of different things we could do to actually solve this issue um but that separatism does go away it says separatism will decay by 0 0.5 yearly until 1478 so it's estimated it'll take 30 years it'll be 30 years before all is gone because and it tells you that right there because um because it's half a percent yearly and that's going to be the same for any of these provinces here same situation so all these provinces are going to be pretty much in the in a similar situation around 10 percent because they're going to have the same modifiers the same war exhaustion the same overextension is being applied to our entire country and they're all getting the same sort of lump sum of separatism that's just getting dropped on them. This one's a little bit lower because they're friendly troops. So as we can see, actually, troop count, having troops standing on these is actually pushing down the, the unrest, but it's not enough to reduce it to zero. In fact, the most that you can reduce is 5% by having 20,000 troops standing on a province. So if we have 20,000 troops standing on a province, we can reduce it by five. What that does mean is conveniently, these guys over here we can actually stomp this out by just resting an army on this. We can rest an army on this and remove this. So I'm not worried about this rebellion at all. This rebellion is not, uh, not going to be an issue at all. Um, the Novgradians, though, there's no way we could stomp out all of this rebellion. One, it's just the values are too high, right? We can only stomp out a rebellion that's five or less because that's the max that we can reduce with troops. And then otherwise, there's just too many provinces. We'd need like hundreds of thousands of troops to stomp out all of these simultaneously, like to have all of them suppressed at the same time. So this rebellion is probably going to happen. Um, we can see that there's a slightly different separatist over here. Um, the Sami culture is causing this to actually want to rebel as a completely different country. So this will be a separate, uh, separate rebellion. These people over here want their own independent state. So we have people that want to go back to Novgorod, and we have people that want to be independent on their own because they have kind of a unique culture. So that's the unrest situation going on. And if we go to overextension, we can see we can manage overextension. And there's another banner up here now that we've ended the war called Some of Your Provinces Lack Cores. So the reason why we have overextension is because these provinces are not part of our core country. We have to core this land. We have to core this land. And that actually requires administrative power. We can see here, it spent 27 administrative power to gain a core in this province. It would take 16 months to do so. And we're getting some penalties there because of the war exhaustion. But oh, look, here's our war exhaustion, 1.3. That's causing a bunch of, of things when it comes to um, negative abilities, when it comes to sieging ability and national unrest and, and diplomatic this and, and manpower recovery speed and all this other stuff. War exhaustion, not good. It is going down though right now. There is a, a negative 0.1, so this will go down in about a year, this will all be gone. And it's, it, it, 
just because it's going down by 0 0.1, but we are taking attrition. It's actually warning us that our troops are still taking attrition. Why is that exactly? Why is that exactly? Well, I think it's because there's just too many troops stacked up in some of these areas. Remember, provinces only have a certain amount of supply limit. And in the winter, we're in February right now, the Russian winters are a real thing. These areas, their, their supply limits are significantly reduced because of severe, it's a severe winter actually, severe winter. So that's actually reducing it significantly. So we need to get these guys sort of split up so they don't take attrition just sitting around. We're not even at war and we're taking attrition over here. That's not good. In fact, we have a manpower deficit, a significant manpower deficit. We're at 5,000 men short of actually replenishing our entire armies. We're in a, we're kind of in a bad situation here. We got some exiled troops. We're just looking at our banners, right? Exiled troops. We have insufficient manpower, so we have casualties among our regiments. We need to replenish those. We have the provincial unrest. We talked about that. Yearly corruption. Your corruption is growing. We can click on that. It goes to our economy screen. We have to spend money to root corruption out. But right now, corruption is going up. So we could try to actually manage this a little bit to kind of keep it down. And it looks like that's the max that we can do is 2.67. We'll keep it baseline. Corruption is something we haven't talked about, but you primarily get it for having overextension. And some other there's some other elements too that can increase corruption. Events and things can increase corruption. And event, essentially corruption, having a lot of overextension builds this up. And it just costs money to remove it, but it takes time too. Corruption is not good because it increases the power cost of everything, which means it makes technologies more expensive. It makes coring land with administrative power more expensive. It makes reducing war exhaustion with diplomatic power more expensive. It makes raising new generals more expensive, right? There's all these different things that we've learned about that we spend these power points on, tons of different things that we have to spend power points on, right? Tons and tons. It's so, this stuff is so valuable and cor having added corruption reduces the, or increases the cost of everything you have to buy with power, uh, these power points, uh, which is not good. So, but one of the things here is it says uh, lack cores. So man, when we manage uh, our overextension, it opens up this tab here, which is our core tab. And it shows that all these provinces are not cored yet. We have to core these things. And, and that's actually going to be the thing that is going to reduce our overextension. As you can see here that each of these uncored provinces are adding up to this total value of uncored land. That's not good. So we need to core this stuff ASAP. And unfortunately, we have actually left ourselves without enough admin power to do this. We can only actually core this stuff. We've ran out of admin power. Heck, we haven't even gotten an admin technology. We're like way behind on admin right now. Good that we have an admin advisor. This is really, really good for us to have right now because we desperately need admin. Heck, we have actually regressed. In terms of our total admin working towards this admin technology, we've actually regressed ourselves a bit, right? We've just, we're in, we're in a hole right now. Just like we're in a hole for manpower, we're in a hole for admin points. We need another 30, 60, 80, basically 80 admin points in order to, 80 or 70 admin points in order to get this all done. Which at this rate, it's going to take a few months to build that back up. And the quicker we get this, the more, the quicker we can get rid of all these negative modifiers, which are, which are destabilizing our country and destabilizing our economy. So it's actually really important that actually when you end a war, you want to make sure that you have admin saved up so that you can core this immediately. That's again, we ended that war hastily, but maybe that'll have been a learning experience, um, both for me as, a, as being a failed teacher. And then also um, just because a lot of the times I think a lot of people end the wars really hastily, but you need to check your aggressive. It warns you about your aggressive expansion values diplomatically. It warns you about your overextension in the cost to core the land. It warns you about how much diplomatic power it's going to cost to take the land, right? We didn't look at any of that stuff. Maybe that's actually kind of fitting that we didn't because we didn't know what coring meant. We didn't know what admin was for. Now we know that admin is incredibly important for coring this land and getting down our overextension. If we don't, we need to allocate a certain amount of our administrative power to core land so that we can continue to fight wars and take more land because otherwise we could get behind and we'd have to actually wait if we, if we can't manage this overextension quickly enough. It takes a few years for this to happen. Now, luckily, it's pretty fast on the basis that we had a claim on this. The speed at which it takes to core this stuff is faster, I believe, uh, based on having a claim. But also, I think it also has to do with the culture. And I believe that uh, this is all part of our culture group here, the Novgorodian, 
And this is all sort of part of um, a, a sort of a Russian culture group. And I believe that that is um, making it so these cores are actually significantly faster. Whereas this core up here is probably going to take longer. Actually, it'd be interesting to compare that just to, just to learn here. Um, whoops. What is the name of this province? Kola. Okay. So this one would be done. Let's see. Okay, so this is taking a year and a half. I think what we'll do is we'll just wait and see how long if this is going to take a year and a half or not, because I think that's actually going to take a little bit longer. We'll have to see if I'm right or wrong about that. Um, let's get all of our troops sort of organized, though, right? We have troops that are black flagged. They need to come home um, so we can sort of move them here. Let's split these guys, right? Because we're noticing there's an attrition issue. So let's sort of like split all these dudes up. Let's detach. We have a lot of friendlies here, right? There's a lot of there's there's only 1000 of our own guys here. But there's a lot of friendlies down here that are attached. So let's let them go home by by clicking that off, turning that off, and letting them go home. In fact, these guys are set up for that too. Make sure no one's going to attach to any of our guys. Try to get all of our dudes just to return home. All right, let's let's let the game run. I think we've man we've looked at our diplomatic situation. We've um, looked at our internal situation. We're coring as much as we can, but we know that's a problem. We have unrest that's happening, but it hasn't actually progressed yet. We will keep an eye on this. But see how that just went up to 20% from 10%? This is making progress. The Novgorodian one is not, ironically, which is weird because this one's much more likely to make progress, statistically. There's only a 4% chance that this makes progress. There's a 20% chance that this makes progress. But this has to make progress 10 times before it'll actually rebel. We will see it coming. We will see it coming. We don't have to completely panic. These guys actually want a royal marriage with us, which is kind of funny. Um, do we have royal marriages with all of our own people? I think we did that, our own uh, vassals and stuff. Here's the interesting thing. Poland rivaled us. I think I caught eye of this uh, when we were just clicking around. Poland rivaled us. They do not like us. We tried to get the alliance with them, but they're like, nope, they rivaled us. They also got the personal union over Lithuania. So this is one big, giant, nasty blob. Um, I don't know who we could actually ally. We could look for Crimea, potentially. We could try to ally Crimea. They're in a war right now against what seems to be um, uh, Byzantium and Theodora. Um, some smaller nations over here, they're winning the war. So that's good to see. They are winning the war. So we could try to, we could ally uh, Crimea. We know that Kazan and the Great Horde, they just they just despise us. It's just very unlikely. We could look, reach down here for the Ottomans, but the Ottomans kind of don't really care that much about us. It'd probably be a lot of work to try to get the Ottomans to ally us, but Ottomans are a very powerful country. We could try. We could try with the Ottomans. There's no point working on Poland. Let's bring back our diplomat. Right click on our diplomat that's working on Poland. Right click, bring him back because Poland has basically said no. We're rivaling you instead. Poland is not looking to make a make a friendship. But we do not have... I'm just clicking on people. Denmark, how you feeling? Teutonic Order, how you feeling? Livonian Order, once upon a time, they were okay with us. Now they don't like us. Um... Although Livonian order is weak enough, they probably would ally. See, all these nations here and here, they're too far away. Just from experience, Austria is too far away to care. Distance between borders, neutral attitude, just they have too many diplomatic... There's so many reasons why they're just not interested in allying us at all. Bohemia, uh, actually, we're, we are getting a small distance without distance from borders modifier there. In, in fact, honestly, the Ottomans are only a minus 40. This is possible. This is possible. Let's work on Ottomans. Let's work on Ottomans, and then what we can do is we can just continue to sort of work on making our subjects happy. What we can eventually do with our subjects is we can actually start to pull them in more directly. They're under our wing right now, and they are loyal, but we can actually work on actually potentially integrating them into our country. So you can annex the vassals, if because we do eventually want to solidify all of this under one name, and we have to do that in order to form Russia. So we do want to eventually integrate these these guys over time. Um, and you can see it is not possible to offer until January uh, 1454. So it takes 10 years. They have to be our subject for 10 years. The game only started in 1444. It's 1447. It's only been three years that we've already done all of this. That's crazy. We could ally some of these smaller little guys down here. Um, it's almost like better than nothing. We don't really want these guys to get removed by like Lithuania and stuff, but... But at the same time, it's like that doesn't do anything for us. I think we're more likely to attack these guys than ally these guys. 
That does nothing for us allying a dude that has 1,000 troop. That just, no, we're, he offered us an alliance. That's what that flashing banner was, but I just ignored it. I just ignored it. We are coring as much as we can. We're waiting for this admin to build up, and we are coring, coring, coring. Getting this stuff underway as fast as possible. See, it'll take three years. It's going to take three years to do this. Most of the time you take land, it'll take three years to core. The reason why it's taking less on these is because um, it's our culture group. This is not our culture group. It's going to take three years to core that province. That's quite a bit of time um, that we have to live with these penalties, right? But luckily, all this other stuff is going to get done fast. We're waiting till we get up to 19 so we can finish the final one. We're moving here. It's October 1447. Time is ticking. Time is flowing. It doesn't look like any of our guys are taking attrition. We have our armies sort of spread out here. And we are still trying to build up manpower because our manpower reserves are still in the negative. I'm kind of wondering, actually, wait a second. Can we maybe get some more manpower from working on anything over here with these guys? These guys wanted... To, we have a mission to get Nizni, Nizni Novgrad up to a base production 7. Remember when we took this agenda? This is a little mission that we have for these guys. Um, we actually could do that. That's developing our country, right? We could spend diplomatic power to do that and get that done. The only thing that's kind of annoying is that we want to save up. We're trying to save up for uh, technologies, right? We're, we're trying to ultimately get to um, the level 4 diplomatic technology and stuff. But we do need to do this eventually. We might as well do it now. Um, I'm just going to hit this two times to develop this province. It is a copper province, so it's not a terrible trade good. You know, it's not like it's not wheat or something or grain or something like that. So that's not too bad. So we'll get that a couple times, and that should get our thing done. There we go. We gained some ducats. Feels good. We're losing money, though. I'm noticing up here in our treasury here, it says we have a negative. There's a negative red negative symbol there. So just instinctively, instinctively, I'm just like, whoa, we're losing money. Something's going on. Let's check our economy tab. We're losing big money over here. Okay, we're paying for a bunch of forts. We're paying four ducats for the forts. Um, we're not at war. We're at peace. We could mothball those potentially. We could even think to try to get rid of some of these. Novgorod is a woods. It could be worth keeping that. This one's also a woods. And it's also on the border of Lithuania, which actually is kind of like potentially kind of important to keep, right? But we could destroy the fort in Novgorod since it's kind of behind this other fort. We could destroy the fort in Novgorod. Or at least maybe even try to relocate it into the in the future up to here or something. It's not a bad fort. Novgorod's not a bad fort. We also know that we're, we might get some rebellion down here. I think um, I think at the very least we're going to mothball the forts and not pay for them. We're going to mothball the forts and not pay for them. Because we had them, of course, while we were at war, but now that we're not at war, we can't really afford them as much. We're paying for the army. We could reduce army pay a little bit. We need some. We need to pay the army somewhat in order to recoup the losses, right? To reinforce the armies as we get more manpower, because we're getting 250 per month. So we do need to recoup um, those guys over time. So I'm gonna, but I'm not gonna pay them full wages. So this will basically allow them to sort of trickle back in to full strength. Oh, we have some troops over here. It looks like. Let's get these guys down here. And our army is not organized at all, at all. We do actually want to probably be spending some time trying to... We, we might need to get... Yeah, we need... We do, I think we have missions, don't we? Here, let's check out our missions. Yeah, tame the steps. We need a province down here. We need to conquer a province in this area. So we need to actually build spy networks. We should be building a spy work right now, not working on buttering up our subjects. Our subjects already love us. Let's build a spy network right now on... Um, who's winning this war, right? Because there's a big, giant war, and it's kind of like... It's hard to tell who's winning it. Uzbek has joined. Uzbek is a big nation over here that, that has helped Kazan, and they've, they're they going to actually win this. Is Kazan the aggressor or the defender? They are the attacker. Kazan is the attacker. So let's actually get the spine network going with... Um... See, that's a tricky thing, because we could get the spine network going with the weaker nation here, right? What is Kazan trying to take? We could, we could go to diplomatic map mode for Kazan. This is interesting. This is interesting. They don't have any claims, right? They have no claims, but they're doing a conquest of no guy. Okay, so the hordes are special. The hordes get just like, they, they basically get see a, a reason to, hordes, this is a horde nation. They are a nomadic horde. 
and they basically don't need much of a reason to go to war. They just they just go to war just for the fun of it, basically. So they're going against no guy. They're going to take a lot of land against no guy. They might not take much land from the Great Horde. We'll have to see. So let's actually try to build a spy network on the Great Horde because we know the Great Horde is going to be weakened. They're significantly weakened right now. And we could sneak in here and take this province probably super easily. Take a couple of these provinces um, for our mission, right? And then our mission gives us, if I'm not mistaken, our mission leads into subjugate Kazan. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to give us free claims on the Kazan area, which is really, really cool. So we take a province from Great Horde, and then we get a free reason to go to war against Kazan. And then eventually, I think this is just going to keep us colonizing, or not colonizing, but conquering all these areas down here. But it does make sense that we've worked on Novgorod first. That did make a lot of sense, because this is kind of a big land grab. Denmark can come up here using Sweden as a jumping off point and conquer a lot of Novgorod. Lithuania can conquer Novgorod. Livonian Order can conquer Novgorod. So this was kind of a little bit of a land grab here. But it does look like there's a bit of a land grab going on down here as well. Okay, guys, it looks like we have, uh, we've looked at overextension, we've looked at aggressive expansion, we looked at unrest. Those rebellions are building up. You can see Novgorod is at 40%. The uh, Novgorodian separatists are at 40%. When those guys become more relevant, we are absolutely going to make sure that we, we need to, um, to basically get, uh, get our troops in order before that actually goes up to 100%. But right now, it's just making small progress. Slow, small progress. Thanks, everybody, for watching this episode. We are moving. Time is flowing right now. Maybe we should pause. A lot of cores coming in there. Good, good, good. That's going to be lowering our overextension significantly. So those cores are coming in. That's reducing our unrest. That's reducing sort of the unrest of the country, right? So we time is flowing right now. I guess we're just going to sort of recoup and try to build up some manpower. And then we'll be looking to maybe attack the Great Horde while they're weak, while they're sort of in a weakened state. We're working on buttering up relations with the Ottomans because we think that the Ottomans could be a good, uh, just a powerful nation down here. And they're a little bit uh, sort of um, away from us, I guess, right? So that means that we won't have any sort of border tension with them, but maybe they'll be able to help defend us against Poland and Lithuania. That'd be really, really neat. So thank you, everybody, for watching this episode. I will see you guys in the next one.